Hello again, and welcome to the third session of the Foxdale Conference on the Doctrine of God's Sovereignty and its Importance. And this time around, we want to consider God's sovereignty and human responsibility. So let me say a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we give you thanks once again for your mercies that continues to abound towards us, your people. And we pray that as we consider these lofty and marvelous things, that our hearts will be filled with gratitude that you are pleased to shed light upon our path and grant us understanding of these deep and rich things that are profitable for our souls. We desire not simply to know that you are sovereign, we desire to understand our human responsibility in light of your sovereignty. So grant, we pray, that the things shared will be of profit to us and that we may be enabled by the power of your spirit to walk in them. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're considering now God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Now, in the history of great conflicts and, and controversies in the church and in the world, I would say that there is perhaps none more serious than the subject that is before us. It has created labels, labels by which Christians are known, labels by which churches are known, and labels by which denominations are described. And you ask yourself, what exactly is the issue at hand, it is confusion surrounding our subject matter. Confusion surrounding God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And the reason is that it doesn't fit logically in our minds when we read certain portions of scripture. If God exercises control over the affairs of men, if it is true, according to the Bible, that he rules and reigns in the affairs of men, then how is it that we are responsible at the same time? And these are the questions that boggle the minds of many, believers and unbelievers alike. Now consider with me the following verses, and as I read it in your hearing, ask yourself the question, who is responsible in 2 Samuel 24 and verse 1, the Bible reads, And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved. Other translation says, He incited David against them. Go, number Israel and Judah. First Chronicles 21 and verse 1, a parallel portion of scripture. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Second Samuel 24 and verse 10, and David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee. O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And then in First Chronicles 21, 78, And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel, and David said unto God, I have sinned greatly, because I have done this thing. But now I beseech you, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly now i've read from two portions of scripture or two chapters of scripture essentially second samuel 24 verses 1 and then further down verses verse 10 and then i've read from first chronicles 21 verse 1 and further down verses 7 and 8. it is the account of david numbering the people of israel we have seen in second samuel 24 that the Lord moved, the Lord incited, as we read, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved and incited David against them to say, go number Israel. And then in Chronicles, we are reading that the devil is the one who provoked David to number Israel. And so the question is, who is responsible? 
Who is responsible for David's action? Is it God or is it the devil? And so when you think about those things, you can understand why people, upon hearing verses like this and reading verses like this, why they are confused. But as we said in the first session, it is important that our approach to Scripture is that we do not lean on our own understanding. It's very important to bear in mind that God is not the author of confusion. And so consider with me as I read your hearing again in James 1 verse 13 as we seek to answer the question from that portion of Scripture. Who is responsible? In James 1 verse 13, the Bible says, and James is writing, and he says emphatically, let no man say when he is tempted, let no one dare bring an accusation against God. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The world lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That is the sequence. But important and part that I am bringing to your attention is that no man can say or should say that God has tempted him to sin. And I think this is interesting as you go back to that portion in Second Samuel and First Chronicles that David does not place at the feet of God the responsibility for his actions. Did God incite David? Did God move David to order his census? The answer is yes, he did. The scripture plainly states that. But who is responsible? David is responsible. In the same way that God had in Pharaoh's heart and raised him up to show forth his power. And this is what we read in Romans chapter 9, verse 14 to 21. Now let me read it in your hearing because it is an important passage of the Bible. Paul writing to the church in Rome says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him who wills, not of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, and that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? With a faint form, say to him, who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lamp to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Now Paul is setting forth propositions, important propositions, and at the same time, he's anticipating the questions that will arise from the propositions, and he is answering them. And ultimately, it boils down to this. Who are you, O oh man, who will dare say that God is the responsible for sin? Who will query God's Actions And this particular chapter is one that is dreaded even by many believers in the Bible. You'll find people who will read Romans 8 and then they skip the chapter entirely, or perhaps with this portion, these this, this verses, and then they go to, right to the next chapter. And then some others find a way to explain it away. But it is clear that God rules. And men are responsible for their actions. 
Those are twin truths that are plainly stated in the Bible. But I think it's important to add concerning God's sovereignty that it doesn't only pertain to his control or his rule and his might and his power. But God's sovereignty is not simply about the display of his awesome power. It is that, but it is also much more. The sovereignty also sees him exercise his power and his rule over all his divine attributes. And so we find that the display of love, the display of holiness, of his holiness and his mercy and his patience and his kindness, his goodness and his wisdom also falls under the divine sovereignty of God. Because when we focus simply on the power of God, then we bring ourselves into this place where we do not have the full of truth of who God is. And that's often what happens. That many do not understand who God is. Many do not understand who he is as he has revealed himself. Many are not able to make sense of the breadth and the scope of the revelation of God. And then what happens is they, they fall into needless and avoidable confusion. And in this confusion, Spurgeon is very helpful. Spurgeon says, when asked to reconcile these two truths, and this is what he says, because you know what the word reconcile means. Reconciliation implies that there's enmity, that you have two warring factions that must be brought together. And that is who we are on account of our sins. We are at war with God. We are enemies of God. We are by nature the haters of the law of God. And then Christ has come to reconcile us to God. The Spurgeon is saying concerning the doctrine of God's sovereignty and the doctrine of human responsibility. But there's nothing to reconcile here. And this is what he says when asked. He says, I wouldn't try. I wouldn't try to reconcile them. Why? Because I never reconcile friends. If two people are friends, if two people are brothers and they are enjoying a wonderful, a wonderful relationship, you do not reconcile them. The subject of reconciliation only comes up when you have two people at loggerheads with each other. And that is what Spurgeon is saying. That the truth of God's sovereignty and the truth of human responsibility are not at loggerheads. Insofar as we can situate these doctrines in Scripture, and so far as we can establish that they clearly find their source in the Bible, then there is nothing to reconcile. Because they flow from the same source. They, they flow from the same fountain head. They flow from God. We have other examples. And I want to read this just to further establish the, 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 the fact as stated in Scripture and the fact that in the mind of God there is no friction. In Jeremiah 25, reading from verse 8, the Bible reads, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, I will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around. I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a heathen, and, and perpetual desolations. This is the account of the destruction of Judah. The Lord had given ample warning. He had sent many prophets to that land. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet on account of his many pleas, many cries, pleading with them to turn to the Lord, to forsake their evil ways, to forsake their idolatry, and to turn to the Lord. And because of their obstinacy, because of their continuity in sin, the Lord, as you read in the book of Habakkuk, he raises the Chaldeans. He raises the Babylonians. The Babylonians are an instrument in God's hand to judge his own people. 
And this is what we are reading here, that he is going to utterly destroy them. With this king from the north. But as we proceed in our reading, we read further down where he says that then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord. I want you to pause and reflect on what I have just said as you read in Jeremiah 25. The Lord raised the Chaldeans as a rod in his hand for justice against his people. And in the very same chapter that he is prophesying the destruction of Judah, he is saying that he will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. He will punish the Chaldeans. And what is the reason he gives for their iniquity? Because the actions that the Babylonians will carry out in destroying Assyria and ultimately in this context Judah is sinful. And you read further down in verse 14. It says, I will repay them according to their deeds, according to the works of their own hands. The Babylonians were responsible for their actions against Judah. They sinned against God though they were rod in God's hand by God's own choosing to deal with the nation of Judah in the New Testament we have in the book of Acts concerning the Lord Jesus Christ similar explanation of this relationship in Acts chapter 2 verse 22 the Bible reads men of Israel Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Him, him, the Lord Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Hear what Peter is saying, that Christ was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. That is an active word. He was delivered. And he goes on to say, you, that crowd, that multitude of people that gathered right outside the upper room, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. God delivered him by his determinate counsel. You put him to death. And both are active. Active words. In front of that, in Acts chapter 3, from verse 13, we read, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you deny the Holy One and the just and ask for a murderer to be granted you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which you are witnesses. They killed the Prince of Life. But then look at Acts 4 verse 27. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Who determined what was done? God. To do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. But the ones who killed were the people. The ones who killed were Pilate. The ones who killed were the Jews. And what happens is that we think that God is speaking from both sides of his mouth. But that is not the case. He's not the author of confusion. And this is where, friends, we need to have a thorough understanding of the decrees of God and how our responsibility relates to God's decrees. 
Listen to me as I read from chapter 1, paragraph 1 of our confession of faith. God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things, whoever, whatsoever, sorry, comes to pass. Yet, so as thereby is God neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein, nor is violence offered to the will of the creature, nor yet is the liberty or contingency of second courses taken away, but rather established, in which appears his wisdom in disposing all things and power and faithfulness in accomplishing his decree. God is sovereign. And the summary of that chapter, which we find in Scripture, and again, I, I, I commend to you the, the confession of faith, that you go read it and you, and you look up all the proof texts that are given in explaining these things. The summary is that God is sovereign, and that God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass. If you listen to the word in Acts 4, 27 and 28. For truly against your holy servant, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to do. In Ephesians 1, verse 11, we read, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so it's very clear that God indeed is the one who decrees what is. And it is according to the counsel of his will. Indeed, in Isaiah 46, you see, you see the same thing. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. We read there, remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not been seen, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, all my will. My purpose, whose purpose? God's purpose will be established and he will accomplish all his good pleasure. And so God is sovereign and God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass. The question then is, does this make God the author of sin? Everything that has come to pass is because God has decreed it. And you can think of all the heinous things that have occurred throughout history. We've just touched on the Babylonian captivity of Judah. How about we go to what is happening in Nigeria at the moment? How about we go to the killing of the millions of Jews? How about we go to the millions that have died in wars? How about we go to the ravages of sicknesses and pandemics? It confuses people. But he decrees whatsoever comes to pass. And you think of the likes of Stalin. You think of the likes of, of Hitler. You think of the likes of Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein and Idi Amin and Mobutu Seseko and Sani Abacha. And you mention all these names and you remember and you recall all their dastardly acts. And you're saying to yourself, can there be God? The Bible tells us. But God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass. He walks all things according to the counsel of his will. Do not fall into the trap of what we considered in the first session 
as I quoted to you from that Nigerian preacher, telling us false things about the nature of God and his rule. So God is not the author of sin. It seems logical that if he decrees all things, well, if he decrees whatsoever comes to pass, then he's the author of sin. But then again, as I read in your hearing from the confession, we read that he does not violate the freedom of man. Again, let me take that. God had decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. Yet, as thereby is God neither the author of sin, nor hath fellowship with any therein. I already read James. Now God does not tempt us to sin. But then he goes on to say in the confession, nor is violence offered to the will of any creature. God does not violate the freedom of man. God is sovereign. He has ordained man to be responsible for his actions. And for men's actions, there are consequences, both positive and negative. In other words, the reason you sin is because you want to sin. The reason you lost is because you want to lost. You cannot feign ignorance about the reality of sin. David sinned against Bathsheba. David concocted a plan to murder a man and take his wife for himself illicitly. And eventually David will be found out. And David will not place the blame at the feet of God. He will not say that God is the one who decreases, decrees whatsoever comes to pass. And therefore, God takes the blame. In a real sense, David knows way better than Adam who said, it is the woman that you gave to me. And so I ask you, as you listen to this message, do you blame anyone but yourself for your sin? Do you credit God with your sin? Do you deny your responsibility because God is sovereign over all your affairs? I want to read again from Spurgeon. And Spurgeon, this was from a sermon preached on this particular topic on God's sovereign grace and man's responsibility. And essentially, he is seeking to show that you have these two parallel truths that eventually will meet only in eternity he says as i read the system of truth is not one straight line but two no man will ever get a right view of the gospel until he knows how to look at the two lines at once i am taught in one book to believe that what i sow i shall reap i am taught in another place that it is not of him that wills nor of him that runs but of god that shows mercy listen to what Spurgeon is saying that God is the one who shows mercy but do we not find the publican the tax collector come alongside the Pharisee into the temple and his head is bowed and he says be merciful to me the sinner he only said to himself God you said you will show mercy to whom you will show mercy and I don't know whether you're going to show me mercy but then he goes there because he knows that God is merciful and he pleads for mercy. The same with blind Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And so this is, this, this is there. It is true on the one hand that God shows mercy to whom he wills. But that is no barrier to us approaching the throne of grace where, as the Hebrew writer says, we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Spurgeon goes on to say, I see in one place God presiding over all in providence. And yet I see, and I cannot help seeing, that man acts as he pleases, and that God has left his actions to his own will in a great measure. And let me not go further, but all of these things have been illustrated so far in this message. Nebuchadnezzar bears the full weight of responsibility for invading Judah. 
And he will eventually confess it when he has conquered his land and he's standing uh, uh, on, 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 the, on the balcony of his palace and just gazing into the, into the far distance as he sees all that surrounds him. And he makes that boast. And God will humble him to the ground. And when he receives his senses, he will indeed extol the greatness of God. Pharaoh is responsible for keeping the Israelites. He was warned separately by Moses. The signs were shown him. The plagues were there. As soon as God hardens his heart, but Pharaoh bears responsibility for his actions. Pharaoh wanted to hold those children of Israel captive. Pharaoh did not care for the God of Israel and the God of all the world. The God who made him. The children of Israel standing in Pilate's court said, we will not rejected essentially saying we will not have this man rule over us as we read in the parable that the lord gives they rejected the son of god in preference for barabbas they said they were with him they said they were with him yes it was by the predeterminate counsel of god but they bear responsibility and all of this comes down to you in your homes in your lives the reason you are in your sin is because you love darkness rather than light. And if you're a Christian, the reason you are, you are not growing is because you do not want to grow. Because the Bible makes it plain that we are to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. So we cannot blame God. So we have these twin truths in the Bible, friends. God is sovereign and you and I most certainly or not, we are responsible. We are to take God at his word. As I've said already in this message and in the first one, we are not to lean on our own understanding. In all our ways, we are to acknowledge him and he will make our path straight. And that applies to our understanding of scripture. If we lean on the Lord, he will make it plain what he has revealed in his word whatever confusion you have about these doctrines credit it to your fallen nature credit it to your own fallen mind now as i prepare to round up i think it's important to illustrate this exegetically from a portion of scripture and so if you return to matthew chapter 11 verse 27 and 28 we will have here a display of the wonderful relationship of the doctrine of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And I'll be taking my reading from verse 25, Matthew 11 from verse 25. And the Bible reads that at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Son, and no one knows, and nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. This portion, as you can see from verse 25, opens with a prayer of thanks given by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord had just finished calling out three cities, three Jewish cities, for their sinfulness. Particularly, Capernaum had witnessed the Lord's display of miracles. In addition, you have Bethsaida and you have Chorazin. And the Lord called, pours forth his will on them. Because despite the preaching and teaching of the gospel, and despite the works of power done in their midst, they did not turn. And he said concerning them, that it will be worse for you than it will be for those three despicable cities in the Old Testament. The names are given Sodom. Tyre and Sidon. And this is the context from which our Lord begins to give thanks. And you find that he does not despair. 
He does not flail his arms in the air as if there is no hope. But renders praise to the Father for his wise dealings with men. And so observe the following from verses 25 to 27. The first is that the Father has the right of choice to whom he reveals his saving mercies. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them. The Lord is in full agreement, perfect agreement, such an agreement that, that brings forth praise from his divine lips at the Father's choice, at the Father's action in hiding and revealing. He has the right of choice to whom he reveals his saving mercy. And the reason given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, as Matthew writes it, is that it is well pleasing in his sight. Isn't that what we read in Isaiah 46 verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will do or accomplish all my good pleasure. This is divine sovereignty. The exercise of his choice proves the sovereignty of God. And the fact that it is well pleasing in his sight further confirms it. Second observation is that the Lord Jesus is a rightful possessor of all things which he mediates as he sees fit. And we see in verse 26, Yes, Father, for this will was well pleasing in your sight. Verse 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom he reveals it. He is the rightful possessor of all things, and he mediates it as he sees fit. It is through the Lord Jesus Christ that all blessings flow. And the crown of God's blessing is the revelation of himself through the Son to us. And the Son is saying that no one, no one, not the general overseers, not the so-called big men of God, not the so-called apostles of our day who claim to have divine revelation that nobody else has access to, Certainly not the Pope. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one has the right to know the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Just think about that. Now if the Son has been revealed to your heart, it is only because the Son willed to reveal himself and the Father to you. In John 17 verse 3, the Lord in his high priestly prayer says, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and himself, Jesus, whom he has sent. This is life eternal. Eternal life is knowing God and it is knowing the Son. And here we read that that knowledge is not earned. That knowledge only comes by the uncoerced, by the volition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So you and I do not have a right to know God. It is entirely the prerogative of the Father to make his son known. It is entirely the prerogative of the Father to elect from the mass of sinners those to whom or in whom he will reveal his son. And it is the prerogative of the son to reveal the Father, to make the Father known. And those of you that know it is because the Lord Jesus Christ who came to seek and save the lost came deliberately to seek you and reveal the Father to you. But I haven't considered this. It seems confusing then when we consider the words 
in the next verse because i have soon as the lord jesus christ speaks in this manner speaks of the divine right of the son of god to reveal the father in the very next breath what is the word that we read come verse 28 come and then you can imagine the lord jesus christ preaching before the crowd and then haven't said that it is his right to reveal these things he says to them come and then you can imagine in the crowd they, they, the people turning to each other and they're saying come who who amongst us has the son revealed the father to but then he says no the bible says all who are weary who should come all who labor and are heavy laden you're not to sit there asking yourself am i among those that the son has chosen to reveal the father to you have to sit down there and ask yourself am i among those that the father has elected to reveal the son to the qualification for coming is are you weary of your sins are you burdened by the weight of your sins that is the criteria that is the criteria come that's the only question you should ask that is the only consideration for coming so divine response divine sovereignty has been established and now we see divine responsibility sorry human responsibility flowing from divine sovereignty the one who determines the choice of his special revelation is the one who says to you come to me and so you can see how many in the church bother themselves with things that are outside their purview they bother themselves with things that are not their responsibility that the lord jesus christ decides who he will reveal the father to is no concern of yours because he has not stated the names of the people that he's revealing the father to your own concern is to respond to that gracious invitation and come you have this marvelous offer given and your concern is to receive it and come the very fact that there is an invitation such as this from the lord should humble you the very fact that he doesn't describe that it is an offer given without discrimination should fill you with joy and praise as you read the bible do you see the woman with the issue of blood asking am i to touch him no she simply goes she simply goes and she touches the hem of his garment you have the other gentle lady saying that the crumbs suffices and you have the other person who came and said we will see jesus and then you have blind Bartimaeus crying at the top of his voice and then you have the tax collector and then you have Jairus, and then you have line upon line of people that have come what is evident was their need and the fact that this savior can save us and can deliver us no questions asked about his sovereignty indeed the fact of his sovereignty is the reason why we come because if he is not sovereign then our human response our human responsibility does not even exist let me say to those who might be hyper calvinist hearing this that when the lord jesus christ says come it is a well-meant offer it is done with the purest motive he has no ill intent he intends to save indeed he says he will cast none away who come to him in faith for so he was named jesus that he might save his people from their sins there is no contradiction here god is sovereign over salvation he is sovereign over providence he is sovereign in every single facet of our lives but we are responsible and god must be sovereign indeed otherwise we will boast in ourselves to the decrement of our souls and as god is sovereign equally true as we have stated all along is that we are responsible again the moment you hear come 
your only consideration is to come. Come to Christ. Come to Jesus. Come to him who promises rest. Say of him, there goes my Savior who will take away my sins. That is what John the Baptist cried. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And if you do not come, do not say that it is because God is sovereign. You bear the full weight of responsibility for not coming. If you have heard, you should come. And if you do not come, whatever it is, and it is clearly revealed in Scripture, your Lord is destruction, and that you will deserve every bit of the wrath of God. So come, come to Christ. And I'll close with some applications, or two applications for believers. The first is concerns evangelism. And this again is to the hyper Calvinists who will say that if God saves whom he wills, then it doesn't matter whether or not we go out and we share the gospel of Christ. We're told to compel men to come in. How beautiful are the feet of those who go forth preaching the gospel, bearing the glad tidings of Christ. The great commission is go. Go in my name. Go and gospelize, evangelize, and spread forth the fragrance of Christ. You'll be held responsible if you do not speak of him. And that's why we preach the gospel. And that's why we gather on the Lord's Day to preach the gospel. And that's why we go out into the streets, into the highways and byways of our cities, sharing tracts and inviting people and pleading with people. That's why we minister to our children. That's why we minister to our relatives and those at work. We do bear responsibility to evangelize. I mean, we cease to say such nonsense things as God is sovereign and he will save. The missionary enterprise that reached the shores of Africa was not because people were hyper-Calvinist. No, they believed in the gospel. They believed that this is news that should be proclaimed far and wide from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth and in obedience by the power of the Spirit, they went forth and they preached the gospel. And secondly, it concerns our sanctification. And this is a topic in and of itself. But I'm just reading you here from Romans 6 and just highlight a few things to show you the importance of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. The Bible reads from Luke, Romans 6, sorry, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Dear friends, that is an imperative. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. The Lord is not saying, or Paul is not saying as inspired by the Spirit of God, that you are sovereign. But you bear responsibility as one who has been awakened from death and granted life in Christ Jesus. You have a responsibility to pray. You have a responsibility to fill your mind with scripture. David said, your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. And so Paul says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Do not let sin reign. Sin will ruin you. Sin will destroy you. The wages of sin is death. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present, again another imperative, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But, the positive, present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Most certainly not. And I know that's brief, but there's enough there for you to pause, reflect, and consider. You can even refer to Philippians 2, 12, and 13. That speaks in the same manner. That God is at work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For that reason. For that reason. 
So God indeed is sovereign. And that is our stay. That is our hope. That is why we can call upon him. That is why we can go to him even as he invites us to come to the throne of grace. The setter is stretched out. Come. Come into the bosom of the Lord and come and enjoy fellowship with the triune God. And your obedience, you will see the Lord indeed transform you and conform you to the image of his son. Are you weak? Are you downcast? Call upon him. Do not let sin reign because the Lord Jesus Christ died for that very purpose to put to death the works of the wicked one. And may the Lord bless these words to your hearts and grant that indeed we may not be confused about these things, but indeed walk in them as we embrace them. Amen.